So as I mentioned, we're here in the Brightstorm Math Lab and we're going to go over a couple of strategies that are really going to help you out on the math section of the PSAT. First and foremost, it's really important to read the question. Put otherwise, it's really important to know what the question is asking. Let's take a look at what this would look like on the PSAT. Here we have a typical question. It says, if 50% of x is 20, what is 10% of x? Pretty straightforward, right? So let's go ahead and start solving just like you would on the PSAT. So we're going to set up our equation and we're going to say 50% of x is equal to 20. If we divide both sides by 50%, we're going to get that x is equal to 40. Well, if we check out our answer choices, we have 4, 16, 20, 40, and 80. x is equal to 40, x is equal to 40, perfect. We've got our answer, right? Wrong. We need to actually read the question and see what it's asking. It's asking, what is 10% of x? So if we take 10% of x and we know that x is 40, we know that our correct answer isn't 40, it's actually 4. Answer choice A. You're going to see all types of questions, and this is the one that most people and most students mess up on. So it's really important to read the question and to figure out exactly what it's asking. On the math section of the PSAT, another strategy that you can use is choosing your own numbers. Now, you can use this in two instances. One, you can use it when you're solving really complicated formulas and you're having to put a lot of steps together. It's actually faster to choose your own numbers. Also, it's really effective when you're solving percent problems. Let's take a look at what I mean. Here we have a question that's going to show up on the PSAT. Not necessarily this question itself, but percent increase always shows up on the PSAT and the SAT, so it's important to know the strategy and to know what they look like. Here we go. Jillian's salary increased by 10% from 2002 to 2003 and by 20% from 2003 to 2004. By what percent did her salary increase from 2002 to 2004? And we have a range of percents for our answer choices, anywhere from 12 to 32%. Now, what we could do is we could set up some complicated formulas, you know, using 10%, using 20%, using X and Y and et cetera. But it's actually a lot easier to choose a number and then to start with that. And then work through what the percent increases are. If you were doing decreases, work through that as well. When working with percents, it's really easy just to choose the number 100. So let's say that from 2002 to 2003, that Jillian's salary started at $100, which is a pretty low salary, but then it increased by 10%, which means that you would multiply times 1.1, which means at the end of 2003, her salary would actually be $110. So it's not asking us to find the increase from 2002 to 2003, it's asking us to find the increase from 2002 to 2004. So starting in 2003 to 2004, her salary starts at $110 and then it increases by 20%. So we're going to multiply times 1.20. Now, when we multiply this out, you can use your calculator if you like, we find out that her end salary is $132. So she started with $100 and then she ended in 2004 with $132. Well, knowing that 100 is the base and that it increased by 32, an increase of 32 over the base of 100 is actually 32%. Let's take a look at our answer choices and see if this makes sense. Well, we've got 12%, 15, 20, 30, and 32, which is an answer choice. If you wanted to, you could go back and you could plug it in and check your work. It's highly recommended on the PSAT and the SAT to do stuff like this. Let's take a look at our other strategy. So another strategy that you can use on the math section of the PSAT and the SAT and the ACT is actually using figures and diagrams. Now, how do you do this? Well, on the SAT and the PSAT, they actually have uh, a lot of figures. Some of them are drawn to scale and some are not. If there's not a note that says, note not drawn to scale, it actually is drawn to scale, which means that you can use it to estimate some of your answers. So let's take a look at this type of question that you might see. In the figure below, a square is inscribed, which means it's inside, in a circle with an area of 16 pi. What is the area of the square? Well, you could go through a lot of really complicated computations and estimations using geometry and area and figures and angles, but you can actually estimate. So let's take some of the information that we're given to get to just kind of a common number, and then we can estimate the answer choices. So here we go. 
we have a circle with an area of 16 pi. As we know, the area of a circle is equal to pi r squared. Since our area is 16 pi, we can set the formula equal to 16 pi. If we eliminate pi from both sides, we get that our radius squared is equal to 16, or that our radius is equal to plus or minus 4. Since we're dealing with figures, we know that it's plus 4. So, given that our radius is 4, we can go ahead and we can estimate using our figure. So, say that, for example, we've got 4 is from here to here, and the area of a square is side to side. So, if this is 4, this is a little bit more than 4. Let's say it's like 5. So, we can say that this is a little bit more than 5. 5 times 5 is 25. So, we're going to estimate that the area of our square is approximately 25. So let's take a look at our answer choices. Right away, we see that 96 is way out there. We learned that in another episode. You can pretty much eliminate outliers right off the bat. Let's go ahead and get rid of that. Now, let's take a look. We've got 4, 8, 16, and 32. Well, 4 and 8 are nowhere near 25, so we can eliminate those right off the bat as well. Let's say 16 versus 25 and 32 versus 25. We know it's a little bit more than 5. 32 is a little bit more than 25. So I'm going to go ahead and guess that my answer is 32. Answer choice D. Well, it's not precise, but it is the correct answer. If you went through and solved it, you'd have to find the area of a right triangle using geometric properties, etc. It's just not worth it when you're able to eyeball it and use your diagrams and your figures, but only if they're drawn to scale, to go ahead, eliminate some answer choices, and then choose the correct one. It's a really powerful strategy for questions involving figures and diagrams. One of the other strategies that you can use on the math section of the PSAT and the SAT and the ACT and other standardized tests is basically plugging in answer choices. Now, what do I mean when I say this? There are two ways you can do this. One, you can actually, if the question calls for it, plug in answer choices into your question. You know, sometimes up in your question you'll have variables. What you can also do is you can plug in numbers into your answer choices. It works really well when you have answer choices with multiple variables. Let's take a look at what this would look like. If x is an even number and y is an odd number, which of the following must be even? Well, let's pick a couple numbers and plug them in. Let's say that x is 2 and that y is 1. No need to make really difficult numbers. And let's plug them in and see what happens. x times y is 2 plus 1. Is that even? Nope. Got to be crossed off. x times y, 2 times 1, minus 1. Is that even? Nope. x divided by y, 2 divided by 1. Is that even? Yeah, it's 2. Let's keep that for now. x plus y, 2 plus 1, 3. Definitely odd. Last one. x times y, 2 times 1. That works too. Sometimes when you choose 1 as an answer choice, it gets a little funky. So let's choose another couple numbers, plug them back in to our remaining answer choices, and see which one works. So this time around, we're going to say that x is equal to 4 and y is equal to 3. Let's go ahead and plug it into our answer choice again. 4 divided by 3. Is that even? No. That's, what is that? It's a fraction. It doesn't even matter. Definitely not even. 4 times 3 is equal to 12. Does e still work? It does. It's even. So we know that our answer is E. Now, it'd be really complicated if you went through and tried to set up formulas and equations and solve, and it could get really complicated. So to save time, it's really important to plug in numbers into answer choices that have variables. Similarly, if you have answer choices that have numbers and a question with variables, plug those answer choices into the question to see what works. So there you have it. You have four strategies that are going to work for the math section of the PSAT, depending what question type you're on. It's really important not only to brush up on your content, for example, if you're weak in algebra or weak in geometry, pull those textbooks out. But you could know all the content you want, and if you don't have these sneaky strategies, you're not going to get as many points as you could if you do know them and practice them a lot. So good luck.